the curriculum evaluation committee meeting on Monday, October 18th. It is 6.02 p.m. and we are calling this meeting to order. Um, may I have the clerk call the roll? Oh, actually, I'll call the roll. We were because we okay. to write it down. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Mr. Greeno, here. Miss um, Gilio, here. And Miss Brown is here. And we have a quorum. Also in attendance, we have Dr. Kimberly Sarfty and um, Dr. Joe, no, Mr. Joe Manzoli. <laughs> um, all right. For the first item on the agenda, we are talking about the West Educational Contract. Yes, so the Nashua School District has entered into a contract with West Ed Consulting, and essentially what's going to happen is they're going to work with our certified ELL teachers who have volunteered to participate in pretty um, intensive professional development so that they can then go and turnkey the information and train our teachers district-wide. Do any of the members of the committee have a question? Yes, Ms. I just, in reading through it, it, it repeatedly says for all educators. I just wanted to make sure this is including our paras, many of whom work with ELL students. Yep, so um, the the professional development that our teachers are going to deliver to the rest of the district. That's going to be specifically for our certified teachers. However, paraeducators are receiving professional development with regard to all things ELL, okay. starting um, on the 20th of October and every early release day throughout the rest of the year. Okay, that sounds great, thank you. Yeah. Mr. Greeno, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I don't. All right, so at this time, um, I believe, are we looking for a motion or is this more informational? All right, so um, I am looking for a motion to recommend that the board approve the contract with West End Consulting for ELL professional development and technical assistance in the amount of $152,000 funded by the ESSER II grant. So moved. Second. All right, so the motion was made by Mr. Garino and seconded by Ms. Giglio. And we, uh, Mr. Garino, how do you vote? Yes. Ms. Giglio? Yes. And Ms. Brown votes yes, motion passes. Next item is our Mount Prospect contract follow-up info. Yeah, so the last time I was here, we talked about our partnership with Mount Prospect Academy, and Mount Prospect Academy is contracted to um, bring four individuals into our schools district-wide to offer individual counseling, group counseling, sort of innovative practice such as art therapy. Um, and one of the questions that the folks here asked about was during a typical school year, so this is a typical school year, on average, how many students receive counseling services? And so what I wanted to do was provide a breakdown for everybody so that you could see just sort of the scope of services that we offer. At the elementary school, on average, 3,000 students seek out counseling services. At the middle school, 13,500 students. And at the high school, on average, 19,600. This is annually. Uh, not necessarily students, um, excuse me. Let me just, made that mistake once. Not the students, but the number of visits that the counselors see. So we don't have 19,000 students at the high school. <laughs> but on average, 19,600 visits. Um, and then in terms of students who are on IEPs who receive counseling services as, as part of, um, the services that are written into their IEPs on average between 200 and 250 students. And I did seek that information from obviously our guidance staff in the district. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you getting back to us with that information. Um, obviously, we have a great need in the district for this right now, and I guess always, this has been something that's been going on for quite some time. And um, I'm glad that we're servicing our students and being available in this way. Does anyone from the committee have a question? No? 
Is this an action item or, or is that just a follow up? It's... Yep, just a follow up. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, well, thank you very much. And um, for anyone at home, if this uh, information is available online under the curriculum evaluation tab on our website in the um, packet of information. Uh, so next, we can move on to the YMCA Power Scholars update. Yes. All right, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Joe Manzoli. I'm the COO for the YMCA Greater Nashua. Um, for the last several years, we've partnered with the Nashua School District to help uh, address the achievement gap in the summer. Um, I came to the, the Board of Education, I remember Mr. Garino was there uh, several years ago when we first presented this concept. Um, this summer, we were back in the school. Uh, last, this, the previous summer, we ran the program remotely um, as best we could. Um, and this summer, uh, we had students back in the classroom. We were excited to see them. Um, and, uh, you know, after the challenging year plus that they had, it was great to have them back and, and be able to focus on their, their academics as well as their social emotional learning. Um, research shows that kids who, uh, particularly from lower income families who, who don't have a program like this in the summer, uh, can regress in math and reading uh, on average of three months. Um, and that can be cumulative. So each summer, they can fall further and further behind. Uh, we're excited about the results we saw this summer. We, we had 235 scholars uh, participate in the full program. Uh, we, had, we had other kids who had signed up and, and didn't uh, end up showing up, but we had 235 who went through the full program. And that's students entering grades one through nine. Um, so we're, we're excited to be able to serve kids uh, right through elementary and middle school as they enter high school. Um, so the, the really exciting data we received back was that uh, those kids who, without a program like this, may have regressed by three months in math and reading, saw a gain of one month in reading, and at least three months. We, that our, our assessment actually stops counting at three months, um, but saw three months gain in, in math. Um, and so when we look at that, just that math score, if we took what, what may have happened if they hadn't been in the program, combined with what did happen, that's a six months, a half a year um, swing uh, in, their, in their math skills. Um, just as importantly to us, those kids got to be together. Um, in addition to the math and literacy that happens uh, during the day, we have a social emotional curriculum uh, that we, we, we run with the kids, as well as enrichment activities, art, uh, physical activity, games, sports, um, uh, field trips, uh, all sorts of fun stuff. So a typical day, uh, the students are in uh, literacy programming for an hour and a half, and then math for an hour and a half. That's with certified teachers as well as an assistant. So we have uh, at, at uh, most 12 students to one adult in each classroom. Um, so the kids get a lot of individual attention. So they're focused on math and literacy throughout the morning. They break for lunch, and then in the afternoon, they're engaged in these enrichment activities that uh, w when we're at our best, those activities tie back to the curriculum in the morning. So if they're uh, reading about uh, the Mexican Day of the Dead in the morning, uh, in the afternoon, they may make masks or do other art projects that connect back to what they learn in the morning. Um, other exciting data that we got back was uh, really related to the, the staff that were part of the program. So 100% of the staff reported that the program helped with their professional development. So in addition to them uh, having some employment in the summer, they're also improving their own skills. Um, and uh, for, for the kids, and you'll see on, the, on that sheet that I handed out, um, we uh, did some uh, surveys with the, the students, mostly with the older students, uh, around their social emotional growth. Um, and I, the, the part that lo I love here is that 82% said that they grew more confident in their ability to learn. So we're hoping that not only are we seeing this gain in math and literacy in the summer, but that that's carrying over in their confidence in learning as they come back to school in the fall. Um, so uh, we're very excited to see the res these results. Um, and and the, the data is great, but what was even greater was to see smiles on kids' faces and being able to put more caring adults in the lives of these kids in the summertime. So. Uh, any, any questions about the program or about the, the data that we've received? Sounds great. 
but certainly it's, a, it's an honor for us to, to partner with the school district on this program. Um, Dr. Sarfati and I have talked about ways we can serve even more kids in the summer. Um, we've uh, fund the program through a mix of funds that the YMCA raises, um, district funds that are set aside for summer programming. Um, the, uh, I'll, I'll point out Gail Casey and the 21st Century Learning Program are, are really great program, uh, program partners with this as well. Um, and so as we start planning for next summer, which we're gonna be doing very soon, our goal is to serve much more than the 235 students because there are more kids who need this program uh, and we have the capacity to do it. Um, so we're gonna be working together to, to figure out how we can get more kids into this program. Excellent, that was actually going to be my question okay. is if you wanna grow, continue to grow the program, how much more do you think you could expand it with the Y facilities? Yeah, so it, we, we actually run the program in the schools. Um, and so our limitations are, are really around space and we've got the space um, it, by using different schools. What we tried to do uh, since we started the program was to, to use schools that were near pools um, so we could add a swimming component. So we've been at uh, Amherst uh, Elementary, Amherst Street Elementary, Fairgrounds Elementary, and then Nashua South. Um, this summer we use both South and North and uh, we bust kids to the Y uh, for swim lessons for the older kids. Um, the younger kids use the city pools. Um, with our, the youngest kids, we actually got a, a grant um, to teach swim lessons. Um, so we actually were taking the youngest kids and busing them over to the Y to get swim lessons. So, so in addition to just, to just recreational swimming. Um, so this summer we, we had the, uh, the capacity financially to serve more than what we did. Um, it was just a matter of, just it was a tricky year and uh, to get those referrals because we, we want to make sure that the kids who are in the program are kids who are going to really benefit from it. Um, and so we, we've been going with a referral pro process with the schools. Um, and it was just a, you know, it was a challenging year for everybody. And so we, we were able to serve these 235. We hope to get um, closer to 400 or even more in future summers. I just, um, I'm just thinking that after the year that, that the staff had to, um, mm -hmm. you might not have gotten, if you had 400 scholars this summer, it might have been hard to get staff, but by next summer, that should be a lot easier because the school year is going normally so far. Yeah, we, ho we hope so. Yeah, that, that, it's a great point. Uh, I think had we uh, had 400 kids, it, it would have been a little bit more challenging, uh, knowing the challenges we had to get to the staff that we needed to, to serve these kids. Um, we had plenty of staff to, to cover these kids and, and then some, um, so the kids actually got a little bit more individual attention. Um, Dr. Sarfti was able to, to come and visit the summer and, and get to see the program in action. And um, we're really blessed that, that we've got some really great teachers from the district uh, who come and, and help out in the summer. Um, it's, it's really amazing to see their dedication to the kids. And, uh, and you're right, I think, I think as we, we get through this year, uh, we'll be able to have more, more staff that are interested in, in picking up some extra work in the summer and, and having this impact. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, do you have anything to add, Dr. Sarfi? I, yeah, I guess two things. The first one is I, I do want to emphasize how dedicated our teachers are. Uh, the fact that you have teachers who are continue, continuing to work and serve the students all throughout the summer is pretty remarkable. So there's that. And then certainly um, Gail Casey and her staff from 21st Century, definitely amazing partners. Um, I guess the only other thing that I wanted to add, and you're probably going to get there, is that so the why has been so has been so helpful in terms of making sure that they tailor programs to individual school needs, student needs, whatever we need, um, just as a, as, a school, as a school community, how can they help us to help our students? And so we've been talking with Joe, his team, and a, a bunch of our elementary principals about what else can we do to, to grow our partnership with the YMCA. And so one of the ideas that we have is this idea of the YMCA Superhero Training Academy. And I feel like Joe probably can explain what this is even more than I can and that I can certainly add to it. Do you wanna talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Superhero Training Academy is a program we, we've, we've been running for, for a few years in some schools, um, just w typically with, with uh, principals that we've had a relationship with, have reached out. Um, initially, that program was designed for kind of kindergarten, first grade students who are maybe having a difficult transition to school. Um, and so we had um, some school leaders in the past reach out and said, hey, we're having this, this challenge. Is there something you can do? And so we developed this Superhero Training Academy 
The idea behind it being that to be a superhero, you need to be um, physically fit, but you also need to have strong character and a desire to give back to your community. Uh, and so we developed this program where, where YMCA staff go to the schools uh, once a week for, for eight weeks and work with students. Um, sometimes those students, it's, a, it's an entire classroom. Sometimes it's students who maybe need a, a little extra support. Um, and we have staff who go in there, uh, play games, uh, keep the kids active, talk about the uh, core character values of, of caring, honesty, respect, and responsibility, and what those mean for a first grader and how they can put those, those values into practice. Um, and then the kids uh, develop their superhero persona, uh, how they're gonna use their core values to serve their community. They make masks and capes. Um, the, the program, it's been a fun program, but we've also seen some really amazing things. A, a story I keep using is uh, a student um, several years ago who had real anxiety about going to school, had chronic absenteeism, was a first grader. Chronic absenteeism, uh, when he did go to school, it was a, a procedure to get him to get off the bus each day. Uh, it would take up to an hour to get him off the bus. Went through Superhero Training Academy, didn't miss a day of school the rest of the year. Um, the teachers reported his, his confidence, he was participating in class. Um, there's probably a lot of different factors there, um, but, but superhero training certainly was some, some part of that. Uh, so Dr. Sarfati and I talked about this a, a few weeks ago. Um, this year in particular, uh, the, the schools are really seeing, you know, uh, students who were preschoolers and then were told, you know, stay home, don't talk to people, don't touch anything. Mm -hmm. um, and now they're in school, right? And they, they didn't have that, that buildup that kids would normally have. And so we're, what, what we're seeing, uh, not just in the Nashville school, school District, we're hearing it across the board, that those kids in that kindergarten, first grade in particular, are really having a tough time with that transition. And so uh, we've worked with, with five elementary schools so far uh, to, get power, I mean, uh, to get Superhero Training Academy up and running. I know we just started in New Searles last week with their kindergartners. Uh, we've got some other schools coming online this week. Um, and these are just, you know, we send three staff over uh, to work with the kids, um, about 30 to 45 minutes, depending on the school. Uh, so we, we're really excited to be able to help the schools with that transition time um, and help kids get acclimated to being in the school setting. Um, I think it's something that I certainly had not thought about that, how challenging that was. We've seen it a little bit at, at our summer camp programs, um, but it's, it's different, you know, being in school. So we're, we're, we're very happy to be able to help with that process. Thank you so much. I'm really glad that you came here to talk about um, expanding that program. The Y has so many things to offer, um, you know, physical, mental, emotional wellness. And I think um, the city, the school district partnering with you guys is a really great decision. And I look forward to continuing to develop the relationship. So thank you, Dr. Sarfati, and thank you, Joe, for coming and talking about it today. Um, is there anything else on the YMCA? Just that... The Oh, I'm sorry, the feedback, excuse me. The feedback from New Charles was overwhelmingly positive. The kids had an amazing time. Teachers were really excited and invigorated. And so we're just really happy to continue to grow that partnership. Uh, Mr. Greeno, do you have a question? No, I, I just wanted to thank Mr. Um, Manzoli for, um, for the partnership with the schools and any way we can support it. I'm happy to support it because it sounds like a great, you're doing great work. And I just wanted to thank you. Thank you. Great, yeah. All right, well, we appreciate you being here this afternoon and um, looking forward to seeing you dressed in tights at the Superhero Academy. <laughs> I look forward to that too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so next thing, we got an update in our... Um, in our packet about uh, each week, Dr. Sarfti distributes an edition of the Curriculum Chronicle, which she sends to teachers um, with professional development opportunities and different exciting news. So she attached the latest edition, which I think was really interesting, and I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, I, I can't take all the credit for that, Dr. McKinney. 
he had um, the curriculum chronicle. I think he's the person who started it, but I just continued the tradition. So it's really great. It's a great way to get information out there to principals, teachers, paraprofessionals, certainly when it comes to professional development opportunities. Want to make sure that we kind of advertise them ahead of time. Um, also, we've been doing a lot of um, after school optional trainings. Teachers reached out to me. Um, they wanted to know more about um, just some technology and how they can enhance their skills around technology, New Hampshire SAS, different things like that. Um, and then also when it comes to instruction, I reached out to our coaches, our amazing uh, content coaches, and they were able to work with me to provide professional development after school. And so some of those opportunities we're able to pay teachers for, which is great, and that's why we wanna make sure that we advertise them so that hopefully they're well attended. Any questions from the committee? No? All right, excellent. And I hope that teachers take opportunity to use those professional developments, especially if you can get paid to do them. That's all extra benefit. Um, and so next up we have Connor's Climb. Yeah. So Connor's Climb, the folks from Connor's Climb are partners of ours. They they offer professional development for teachers, paraprofessionals, and really the focus is suicide prevention. This is a free service that they afford us. And so what we wanted to do was, um, our, many of our folks have already participated in sessions with the folks from the Connors Climb Foundation. And we're looking to sort of implement phase two of their training. Um, initially, we were going to offer this training on December 8th, but I, I think that date actually might be moved. Um, but we are planning, we are in the, in the midst of planning the, the PD so that we can make sure that we know how to spot a student in crisis and then prevent, um, well, just be able to support the child. Thank you. I think um, last year, maybe around this time, um, or maybe it's the end of the year, there was an update to the um, suicide prevention curriculum requirements from the state level? Yeah. Does this fall under that for this professional development? Certainly does, yeah. It meets all of those requirements. Excellent. Um, I hope, I really appreciate you putting this together and um, the Con Connors Klein Foundation to facilitate it. Any questions from the committee? Not at this time. All right, thank you. All right, finally, we have the New Hampshire Fall Interim SAS Report results. So these interim assessments were administered to all students in grades three through five. I think it's important to note the assessments measure proficiency of grade level standards. So we have to understand that students are entering the grade. Um, so it, we are not expecting students to demonstrate proficiency at this time because they were tested on standards that they haven't yet been exposed to or they hadn't been, yet been exposed to. Um, Testing concluded, I believe, on October 6th for grades three through five. Um, so what we see here is, what we see here is basically a baseline. We know where our students are starting. The good news is that in some of the content areas, we, so specifically um, in ELA, we have between, uh, I'm gonna say like on average, 4% of our students are already above grade level, the grade level standards. So that's where they're starting. And that actually gives us really good information because we need to identify who those students are so that we can provide to them acceleration activities so that we keep that momentum going. Um, we also have a number of students who are already able to demonstrate proficiency of grade level standards. So that's actually a really exciting thing because again, we need to be able to identify those students to continue to challenge them. Um, and the great thing about the, the New Hampshire SAS data that we get from the state is that it does break down performance by student. So we can, well, it, it will break performance down by um, school, by grade level, by content area, and then by individual student. So we can help to identify specifically what students' needs are. Um, so when we have, a lot of the schools have wind blocks, what I need blocks, and essentially that's a time to provide intervention and or acceleration. Um, so again, we can really use this, this data when it comes to our students who are exceeding proficiency and who are already able to demonstrate proficiency to accelerate them and then figure out, you know, even during core time, what we can do to keep continue challenging them.
We also have a significant number of students who are approaching proficiency. So again, that's, that's also really positive for us because we have students who come to us with a lot of skills. You know, I think about, I was talking to somebody today and I was thinking about if we're showing up uh, to the first day at basketball practice. These are kids who know how to, you know, they know how to dribble. They, they, they have a lot of these skills. Um, and so that's actually really exciting for us. And then um, certainly we have a number of students who have limited skills. And, and that's not surprising for us to see because again, these are grade level, these are grade level standards that they haven't yet been exposed to. However, we, we like to see students come to us um, with skills so that they can access curriculum with, I don't wanna say minimal support, but with less support. Um, so this is important to us because it helps to inform our instruction in the classroom. We see, according to this data, that we really need to focus on mathematics. I think that um, that's one of the reasons why Joe's data around the three months gained in math during the, the Power Scholars Academy, that's really exciting data, and I think that only helps to um, build some credibility in our decision to try to grow that Power Scholars program. But certainly we see that math is an area of focus for us. So what we did was, and, and it doesn't show here in your copy, but what we did as a district was we broke this down by math domain, broke it down by school, broke it down by grade level, and really tried to hone in on what are our focus standards for each grade level. So the Common Core identifies what our major clusters are, what our focus standards should be, and we should be spending around 80% of our instructional time on those focused clusters, those focused standards, so that we can build a strong foundation so that kids are prepared to move from one grade level to the next. So we really wanted to dig down deep into this New Hampshire SAS data to see if we have students who have very limited skills coming to us, where can we sort of leverage our time and leverage our intervention time so that we can make sure that we really try to build those foundational skills. Thank you, that was a really good breakdown of this information, how it can be used. Um, I'm really glad we're taking that. Any questions? Go ahead, Ms. Gilio. Um, I just wondered um, how often during the year are these assessments done? Yep, that's a great question. So interestingly enough, this is an interim assessment and we're, we, we, <laughs> we administered it in the beginning of the year to see where our baseline was. We will administer it again mid-year and then students will be assessed um, with the summative assessment from New Hampshire SAS in the spring. Mr. Greenell? Um, no, I, I just want to say that um, if I'm looking at grade three and grade four and I see so many percentages, like say 4% exceeds and 15 is proficient, then we ought, to, we ought to be commending the grade two teachers for having students go into grade three already proficient or exceed proficiency. Their parents and their teachers, the second grade teachers are doing a good job because they're going into third grade. A, a, lot, a lot of times, and this is just a baseline, this is just their starting point. So I think that should be emphasized. Uh, this is where students are starting at the beginning of the year because a lot of times people take these numbers and they, they go off on tangents with them. So I, I just wanna make sure that everybody knows, everybody in the audience knows what we're looking at. This is a beginning of the year assessment um, as a baseline. But um, it'll be interesting to see what happens later on in the year, but thank you for bringing this to us. Great. Yeah, and, and I do, I actually do want to agree with you in terms of really commending our, our teachers, our parents, our students, because clearly they're working really hard. We have a lot of students who, ha who are coming to us in a really, really good spot, and it's, pr it's pretty remarkable given the fact that we had disrupted learning for a year and a half. So certainly something to be commended. So one positive thing I would like to point out is that um, it does see that there's some pretty substantial improvement um, in the area of ELA from third grade to fifth grade. So that's pretty, it's nice to see. Um, my question in regards to um, the math scores, we see kind of a big dip. Oh, well, we see they improve in fourth grade and then kind of um, looks like they struggled a little more. Do you think that's curriculum materials based or difficulty? Um, we have f more people in the, and for math in fifth grade that are in the um, 
warning area than in the fourth grade. So is, do you think that's a materials item or? Um, so I can't I can't say exactly why that is, but what I what I do know is that we're definitely committed to implementing our math materials with fidelity. It's very important that we consider pacing and we stay on track so that students do not miss content. If we fall behind in our instruction, then we will guarantee that students will miss out on, on certain areas, like they'll miss out on content. Um, so it's really important for us to kind of track where teachers are and then figure out in terms of their pacing and then figure out if we have students who are not there yet, if they're not able to demonstrate proficiency, what specifically do we have to do to meet students where they are and then move them towards grade level proficiency. I will tell you that um, all of our elementary principals came up with action steps to improve math performance and for every single principal, one of the things that they talked about was fidelity to our math curriculum. Our math curriculum has been vetted ad nauseum by people who are much greater experts than I am and the materials are 100% aligned to the Common Core State Standards, um, embrace all of the mathematical practices that we wanna see in our math classroom. It's, it's definitely a newer type of instruction. There's a lot of emphasis on conceptual understanding of math, and that's something that we have to do a better job of in terms of providing our teachers with professional development. How do you teach a standard, not only the procedural aspect of a standard, but how do you teach the conceptual aspect? And that's very different from what we've been doing for a long time time just as educators. So um, I would say definitely fidelity to our curriculum, but at the same time, we need to do a better job of, of offering professional development to our teachers. And if I may, um, on, on November 2nd, we have a, uh, a math consultant named Carolyn Worcester. She's very well known in New Hampshire. She is going to be working with our elementary teachers for part of the day. We have a full in-service day. She's going to start off with grades K-2, and then in the afternoon, she's gonna be working with grades three, five, and she's really going to focus on, again, meeting students where they are, and not, um, not lowering expectations, not reteaching a grade level before. A lot of times, you know, we're not sure where to start, so we just kind of reteach all the math. She's going to talk to teachers about how to isolate the unfinished learning, and then move kids towards grade level proficiency using very concrete strategies. And also, again, um, how to employ practices so that we teach the conceptual aspect of math. So kids understand the why, not just the steps, not just the procedure, but the why things are the way that they are. Thank you so much, and I really appreciate um, you having making the announcement November 2nd, there's gonna be a math consultant coming in, that's fantastic. <laughs> and I think that's a really, make a really great point. Making sure students are met where they at, and then we can also push the students who need that little extra um, enrichment, we can move, let them have a little extra and then make sure everybody's proficient by the end of the year, so thank you. And if I can actually, um, plug our math curriculum and just give my support for it. I've been the parent that struggles from um, an educational standpoint from the way I learned to do math yeah. to the, the math curriculum we're using now. And I do think the fourth grade math is the hardest from a parent's perspective to teach um, at home to your, to your children. But um, once they get to the next level, middle school, and then up to high school, um, the arc of that, uh, the Eureka curriculum really comes together. And I know from a, my parents at home, believe me, it's true. Um, the number sense that kids have by the time they get to high school is much stronger than what it was with previous curriculums that we've used. So I actually do support this type of curriculum and I do think it's good, so thank you. Great. Um, so with that, does anyone have any questions or anything to add? Magnificent. Okay, um, I guess I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All right, motion by Ms. Giulio and seconded by Mr. Raymond or Garino. Mr. Garino. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Raymond Garino. Um, and uh, so, uh, Sharon Giulio? Yes. Mr. Garino? Yes. And Ms. Brown votes yes. We are adjourned at 6.36.